All right, we're back. Now, where we left off last lecture was the big question of why of these three great Eurasian empires was it the West that came to so completely dominate in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century? One reason uh, might simply be that the West had a head start. We talked about how civilization didn't really get going until the agricultural revolution. It was necessary for the nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes to settle into permanent villages with a reliable supply of food such that they could build up civilization. Now that agricultural revolution didn't occur at the same time everywhere. If you look across the world, the first place where agriculture was discovered was in the Fertile Crescent, which was the progenitor of the Western European civilization. They had a head start of two to 3,000 years on, for instance, the uh, Chinese civilization in the Yellow River Basin. And two or 3,000 years can buy you a lot. So this is from Ian Morris's book. And what he shows here is when various benchmarks of civilization were reached in the West versus the East. And you see that with the exception of simple pottery, uh, almost every single other thing had about a 2000 year head start in the West compared to the East. The West developed dogs first, cultivated plants first, big villages first, domesticated animals first, uh, towns and big buildings first, etc., etc., etc. And this carries on, actually, if you look at all the places where agriculture developed. Uh, if you compare the five major places where it independently seems to have emerged, you see that if you cultivate your plants first, if you develop agriculture first, you're able to develop everything else earlier as well. However, I don't think this is our best explanation for two reasons. First, the Fertile Crescent civilization was the one that spawned both the European civilization through the Roman Empire into Europe, uh, as well as the Muslim Empire. So both originated with that 2000 year head start in the agricultural revolution. So we can't explain the difference between Europe, uh, between the European and Muslim Empire, uh, just through looking at uh, the advantage in agricultural revolution. But we can't even explain the difference between the European and Chinese civilizations due to uh, the Western advantage in uh, agricultural revolution. This is also from Morris's book. He has this interesting way of quantifying the uh, level of civilizational advancement. And he does so by putting a metric on how much of the energy you're able to extract from your environment. Uh, initially, that's just th done through the sweat of our uh, human brows. Uh, but then you can extract more energy by uh, making use of beasts of burden and eventually through fossil fuels and all the rest of the ways that we're able to develop energy now. And what it shows is that, of course, there's been this gradual increase, uh, well, and then a steep increase in the amount of energy we're able to extract from our environment. But it also shows that for almost all of this time, this 16,000 year period, uh, the West has had an advantage over the East. But it's only almost the whole time. You see that... Around 500 AD, the East actually overtakes the West, and they maintain dominance until the eve of the Industrial Revolution, about 1300 years later. And so we can't explain why the West was able to dominate in those later centuries, based on what happened earlier on, because the East managed, at some point, to catch up. We need a new explanation for why they caught up but then fell behind again. So really, why the West? Now this of course was the topic of uh, the book by Neil Ferguson that he was talking about in his TED talk and he mentioned these six killer apps uh, that he believes uh, both necessarily and sufficiently explain uh, Western advancement. He's very confident about it. Um, we are only going to talk about two of these. We're gonna talk about the first two, competition and science, but we're gonna talk about them from the particular lens of the themes of the course, the themes of evolutionary psychology and cultural evolution. So let's start then with China and competition. Were you to travel back to the age of Columbus, 15th century, and you were to look at the various powers on the globe, 
you would not have put your money on Europe. At that time, China was significantly more advanced in almost every dimension than Europe was. This is the ship that Christopher Columbus used to uh, sail to the New World um, in 1492, uh, put alongside the treasure ship of Zheng He. My apologies if I'm butchering all of these Chinese names uh, for the next several slides. Um, but this was the Zheng He treasure ship of 1400, or at least this is the legend of the Zheng He treasure ship. It might have been a little smaller. And legend has it that it wasn't just this one ship, that there was an entire fleet uh, around 1400 AD of multiple ships, uh, 48 to 317 ships with a 28,000 person crew. They were significantly more advanced than anything that existed in Europe at the time. And yet, it was not the Chinese to sail to the New World. It was the Europeans. And as a result, the Europeans managed to unlock and extract the wealth of the New World, thereby fueling their advantage in the next 500 years. So why not? Why was it not the Chinese? Well, one explanation is geography. So you can see that the outcropping of the Iberian Peninsula, where Columbus sailed from, uh, in Europe is actually considerably closer to North America uh, than China is. Uh, this is the path that uh, Christopher Columbus took, and this is the path that you would have to take from China to uh, reach a similar point in the New World. This is not to say that it was impossible. Uh, in fact, using technology that they had at the time, people have recreated uh, those ships, and successfully made this voyage. It was possible geographically for China to have done this, and yet they didn't. So a better explanation might be certain cultural and political events that were happening in China at the time, and potentially the culture that underpinned them. So the first uh, emperor of the Ming Dynasty was the Hongwu Emperor. And in 1368, right on the eve of the age of exploration, he decided to ban ocean-going vessels. Now, there's debate about what the actual reasons for this were. The purported reasons were that there was Japanese uh, pirates, and he wanted to have an embargo on uh, Japan. And so to do so, he wanted to cut off trade with Japan and did so by banning ocean-going vessels. Uh, this was a spectacular failure. So spectacular failure and so unproductive for the ostensible purpose that people speculate that there might have been uh, another reason for it. But uh, this particular emperor was uh, pretty serious about this sea ban called the Haijin Principle, I believe. Uh, he made it part of the ancestral injunctions that he left for uh, subsequent emperors saying that uh, we should not be launching great conquests by uh, uh, sea, and we, should and, and we should instead be focusing on domestic affairs. One of the big domestic affairs was uh, the threat of Mongols on the northern border. Uh, and so there was a lot of energy and funds that were devoted to dealing with the Mongols rather than exploring the world. There were a lot of funds that were devoted to building a wall rather than reaching out to other cultures. Now, by 1424, this was after the Hongwu Emperor died, but as I mentioned, he left these instructions for subsequent emperors. Uh, Long-range voyages were banned, and the great fleet of Zheng He uh, rotted away. And as I mentioned, this was right as the Age of Discovery was beginning in Europe, right? That was kicked off by the Portuguese in the early 15th century, uh, and then the rest is history. All right, so how is this related to competition, and how is it related to the course? Well, this is what China looked like during the Ming Dynasty. It was a unified empire. And at the same time, this is what Europe looked like. It was a fragmented collection of hundreds of different polities. And that fragmentation, that difference between being a unified empire and uh, a collection of warring entities uh, turned out to actually be an asset from an evolutionary perspective. So the individual states of Europe were almost constantly at war. England 
itself for 800 years from 1100 AD to 1900 was at war almost one out of every two years. And in the midst of that competition, you didn't have a situation like you had in China where there could be a single emperor who could set a policy for the entire place. Uh, nobody had that much power. And in fact, with Columbus, he uh, was an Italian who initially sought uh, support from the Portuguese to sponsor his voyage. The Portuguese turned him down. And so he managed to go to uh, a, a, another competing state at that time, the court of Spain, who ultimately funded him, uh, which had a massive return for Spain. Um, but it demonstrates that even if there was a monarch in one place that was uh, against these types of sea voyaging uh, expeditions, you could just find another one who wasn't against that. All of these states were in locked competition, and the consequence was that they took different strategies, and some of them worked better than others. Now, the New World, as I mentioned, that um, the Europeans then managed to scramble and carve up between them at the same time as they were carving up Africa between them, unlocked the wealth that was necessary to fuel uh, first the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment and ultimately the Industrial Revolution. And when the Industrial Revolution hit first in Europe, in England first, uh, basically at that point the jig was up for competition between uh, the various empires of the world, at least for several hundred years. Um, that gave them such a big advantage that they managed to dominate the rest of the world. Now that's a historical explanation. It's a bit of an accident of history explanation, though with a cultural element underneath it. But there is a more evolutionary and psychological explanation at heart here as well. And to understand that, we have to go back to something that we learned about a couple lectures ago, which is the idea of cultural group selection and the types of adaptations, the types of cultural adaptation it's able to unlock. So the social learning mechanisms of cultural evolution, things like the conformity bias that we talked about, are able to make whatever local norms emerge in a particular group pervasive within that group. So say you have different groups, they all come up with different norms, they then have those norms come and dominate uh, the group itself. However, you need cultural group selection to select from those norms which one is going to be most beneficial at the group level. You need a group level selection to make group level adaptations. And that only happens when the groups are in some form of competition. When that happens, the cultural evolutionary forces from that competition exert the pressure that needs to be solved by group level adaptations. And the argument is that that's what happened in Europe in a way that didn't happen in China or in fact in anywhere else. And that's what's at the heart of the argument in Joe Henrik's uh, new book, The Weirdest People in the World. He makes this point that uh, general trust, uh, a trust in the general member of your community that you might not know, and impersonal prosociality norms, that is prosociality that's extended even to the strangers within your community, rather than just to the people you, who are closest to you and whom you're related to, uh, were one such group level adaptation. The fragmented states of Europe provided this cauldron of selection in a way that the unified empire of China didn't in order to have these norms selected for at the group level. And it was important to have a very strong normative force behind them in order to suppress the more natural and intuitive kin and clan based prosociality that has us putting our nepotistic and cronyistic motives above the interests of the whole group. And this general trust and general and personal prosociality uh, is what ended up laying the groundwork for European prosperity in a way it didn't in other places. Now, Henrik goes through a lot of compelling evidence for this. Uh, one of the most interesting recent studies to bear out the idea that more impersonal prosociality became embedded in uh, European culture comes from this massive social psychology study that was conducted uh, uh, last year and published in Science. Uh, what they did is they took 17,000 wallets, stuffed them with varying amounts of money, and then lost them 
in 355 different cities across 40 different countries. An enormous experiment. And the question was, what? And the question was, uh, would people return the wallets or would they keep them for themselves? Here's what they found. What this shows is the rate at which the wallets were attempted to be returned uh, across the 40 countries that they tested it in. If you look at the first quartile, you see that every single country in the top 25% is uh, European, with the exception of New Zealand. In the bottom quartile, the countries with the lowest reporting rates, not one country is European. And at the very bottom of all of them is China. Don't shoot the messenger. This is just what the data show. So this supports the idea that it was competition, often in the forms of war, that created this cultural group selection that produced higher levels of within-group cooperation. Now, it may seem paradoxical that things like war and competition could produce cooperation, but it's actually not. Think about sports. So when you have an individual sport, something like track or uh, golf um, or boxing, uh, all that matters is the individual performance. And that's what people aim to maximize. But in team sports, where you have competition between different groups, that is between different teams, something more needs to be developed. There is a pressure for teamwork to develop. The individual skills don't matter if you can't create something that is greater than the sum of your parts. It's only by doing that that a team is able to succeed at this higher level of selection, at group selection. And so between group competition brings out within group cooperation. You don't just look out for yourself anymore. Instead, you do what's necessary for the team to triumph, uh, even if that comes at the cost of your own glory. And that's sort of the story of evolution, that it is through cutthroat competition that these most beautiful adaptations can emerge. Here's uh, Darwin from the last passage of his Origin of Species. He says, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. Now, speaking of Darwin, and speaking of competition, I had talked about in a previous class about how in order to come up with a theory of evolution, Darwin had to stand on a number of shoulders. One of the shoulders that he stood upon was uh, those of the economist, really the father of economics, uh, Adam Smith. Now, Neil Ferguson talked about Adam Smith in his lecture, um, and he specifically referenced the publication of The Wealth of Nations. When Darwin was a student at Cambridge, he was reading a lot of these Scottish Enlightenment figures uh, like John Locke and Adam Smith. And they've been heavily influential. Those of you guys who know about economics can see the idea of the invisible hand uh, in some of the theorizing about evolution. Now, in The Wealth of Nations, uh, probably the most famous passage is when Adam Smith describes uh, the benefits of the division of labor. And he has this passage where he talks about how uh, you have a pin factory. And if you have 18 different people working on a different aspect of building a pin, you can create way more pins than you could if any one individual was trying to do every single little bit of making a pin. It's an interesting passage. What's particularly interesting about it is that it seems like it's completely ripped off. And it's ripped off uh, from something that a Persian philosopher wrote about 700 years before. In Al-Ghazali's works, he talks about not a pin factory, to be fair, uh, but a needle factory. And he talks about it not being the product of 18 different people working on it, but of 20 different people working on it. Uh, it is a direct ripoff. And indeed, Adam Smith is well known for being somewhat economical with his citations. But that doesn't bother me that much. Because as we'll see, there are worse things than being a copycat. For instance, you could not be a copycat. So Al-Ghazali was <clears throat> born at the peak of the Muslim Golden Age. If you were that person who came and surveyed the world, not at 1400 or 1500, but came instead at the year 1000, you would not put your money on either Europe or China, you would put it on the Muslim Empire of the Middle East and Persian Gulf. 
the Muslims at this time were by far the most advanced people at mathematics, medicine, science, etc. One of the reasons for that is because they did such a good job of translating the knowledge from all around the rest of the world. There were people at the uh, Great Library of Baghdad, also known as the House of Wisdom, who were mandated. Their whole job was to gather the knowledge of the rest of the world and then to translate it into Arabic. They did this for the ancient Greeks. They did this for uh, the knowledge coming from India and China to the east. Uh, and they did their own innovations. And then they stopped. First they stopped translating, and then they stopped innovating. And then you saw this long, slow, and sad decline of the Muslim empire. Now, there are many reasons why this likely happened. But from my reading, the biggest one is Ghazali himself. And in particular, it's this one book that he wrote called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. This book is a profoundly anti-scientific book. It is an endorsement of Quranic literalism. It is a rejection of a naturalistic investigation of the world. Ghazali, in it, he says that there is no point in trying to understand the laws of nature because Allah is unchanged. The laws don't bind him. But perhaps most damaging is he makes the claim that knowledge that was written by non-believers, by non-Muslims, uh, is invalid and corrupting. And that includes not just the contemporary people who are non-Muslim, but, but also includes the ancient philosophers, say the ancient Greek philosophers who existed well before Islam was formed, uh, and on whose knowledge the Muslim empire had hitherto done such a great job of building. Now, we can trace the impact that this book had. Here is a record of the proportion of all books that were published in what we would call the Muslim world at the time uh, that were written about science. And as you can see, there is this peak that happens during that golden era uh, in the Muslim empire. And then there is this decline. This is when Ghazali lived. And The Incoherence of the Philosophers was published sometime between 1091 and 1095. You can see that right after that, you see this steep decline. You don't see this decline for religious books, on the other hand. It only happens for books about science. And as their lead in science evaporated, so too did their prosperity. Now, there was nothing inherent, nothing locked in about Islam or the Muslim people that made it anti-science. If there was, you wouldn't have seen this golden age that they had in the preceding centuries. But they did that when they were making use of all the minds that they had access to. They deliberately turned away from that. Uh, and they did that just as the Europeans were doing the opposite. In Europe, they had no compunction about translating the Arabic works into whatever it was that they spoke in Europe. Uh, and they then drew on all the knowledge that had been accumulated in the 8th to the 11th centuries in Islam and used it to propel their own Renaissance and eventually Enlightenment. And the knowledge that they accumulated started producing these positive feedback loops. The Golden Age in uh, Islam in the 8th century was spurred in part by the innovation of papermaking that had come from China. In Europe, the innovation of the printing press had a similar effect on rapidly increasing the velocity of information that could travel around, thereby increasing innovation even further. In the Muslim world, however, in 1515, Sultan Salim of the Ottoman Empire uh, banned the use of the printing press. The consequence of this deliberate turning away from science meant that the technology gap between the Muslim Empire and Europe continued to widen, eventually with um, significant military consequences. This is the cost of cutting yourself off from the human project. It's a sad story, but there's also a lesson to be learned here. In a previous class, we talked about how larger population sizes among Polynesian islands, but also more integration with the other islands allowed for more complex cultural innovations to be produced. The more minds you're able to draw on, the better your ideas are going to be.
The question of the course has been how could evolution produce a being that could finally turn around and understand that process of evolution itself? And as we've talked about, it wasn't enough to build Darwin's brain. Because to develop his theories, Darwin had to inhabit the brains of all these other people. He had to draw on as many other minds as possible. The lesson here is that we benefit most when we integrate ourselves as fully as possible into the human project. We benefit most when we take on as many ideas as possible, regardless of who they come from, and regardless of how much they challenge the fundamental ideas of the societies that surround us. Just as they challenged the religious ideas in the time of Ghazali and in the time of Darwin, and just as they challenged the political ideas in the time of Lysenko, and in our own time. Understanding evolution required all of it, from the ancient Greeks to Ghazali, to the economists and the philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment, and to the geologists and the uh, pre-Darwinian biologists of Victorian England. All of those people's ideas were part of Darwin's cultural inheritance. And now he, and everything else we've learned in this course are part of ours. En jean, en short ou en gelaba, comme on le dit là-bas, bébé, Inch'Allah.